certainly uplifting. We are studying through the pastoral epistles and we're almost done. We went through 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and now we're in Titus chapter 2. Next week is Titus chapter 3. So we'll be coming to a conclusion very shortly. I have just really enjoyed preaching through these books because they give us a great picture of what the church ought to be. And one of the things that we learn from these passages is uh, it's essential to get godly, godly people in leadership. That church should be transformative and teach the truth and be faithful to Scripture. But that there's a lot of freedom, freedom in what church looks like. And so there are some things that we can do this way or that way, and God is happy either way, uh, so long as people are uh, maintaining a faithfulness to the doctrine of God and that their lives are being transformed into um, a character that reflects God. And so uh, that's where we, um, we see all of this leading, and that's, I think, going to be also the theme of Titus chapter 2 this morning, which we will be uh, looking at. I wrote as a title for the message of people for his own possession, eager to do good works, which seems like quite a long title. Maybe I should have just called it While We Wait for the Blessed Hope. That would have been another good title for it. But either way, we're going to be uh, hearing a lot from God's Word today. Let's open our Bibles to Titus chapter 2. I'm going to read the chapter for us, and then we'll jump in and see what applications we can make for ourselves today. Titus chapter 2. But you are to proclaim things consistent with sound teaching. Older men are to be self-controlled, worthy of respect, sensible and sound in faith, love and endurance. In the same way, older women are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, nor slaves to excessive drinking. They are to teach what is good so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and to love their children, to be self-controlled, pure, workers at home, kind and in submission to their husbands so that God's word will not be slandered. In the same way, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. Make yourself an example of good works with integrity and dignity in your teaching. Your message is to be sound beyond reproach so that any opponent will be ashamed because he doesn't have anything bad to say about us. Slaves are to submit to their masters in everything and to be well-pleasing, not talking back or stealing, but demonstrating utter faithfulness so that they may adorn the teaching of God, our Savior, in everything. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, instructing us to deny godliness, godlessness and worldly lust, and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession, eager to do good works. Proclaim these things. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. May the Lord bless the reading of his word today. So Paul wrote to Titus, who was in a similar position at that time as Timothy, one who went to Crete and was putting in order the things left undone when the churches started in Crete and to appoint elders in every church. What we had was a sort of an association of churches there in Crete. But Titus was going to make sure that uh, things were in order, things that needed to be done were done. And so I think when you're reading through Titus, you can see the first and the last verse of chapter 1, the first and the last verse of chapter 2, give us uh, 
what the purpose of the book is and what the purpose of each chapter is very good, very well. The purpose of Titus and the motive for what we read here in Titus chapter 2 can be found in the very first verse of Titus. It's, it's that expression that says why Paul wrote, for the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. For the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. This is why Paul wrote Titus. He wrote to Titus, for the faith of God's people, that would be you, you belong to the Lord, you trusted him as your savior, it's for your faith. And their knowledge of the truth so that you might know what's true according to God's word, that you would be uh, knowledgeable of what God wants, who God is, knowledgeable of salvation. And then also, it's the truth that leads to godliness. We have to come to a place where not only do we acknowledge that God's word is true, but that we have put our faith in God in such that we say, I know so well that this is true that I'm going to live my life according to it and trust God no matter what. That's what the Bible tells us to do. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is one of our favorite uh, passages of memorization. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. So what we have to do is look at God's word and say, if this is true, then what do I need to do? What do I need to change? Because I'm going to live the truth no matter what. Jesus told us that if we were going to be his disciple, that we had to count the cost first. That anyone uh, that is prudent is going to count the cost of something. So why would you start to build a building and not check to see if you have enough resources and money to do it. Why would you go to war against another army if you didn't first check to see if your army was big enough to overtake them? Jesus said this, count the cost. But if we will look and say, I believe that this is true, and it's going to cost me total obedience and dependence upon God, if we do that, then we live what God's word says no matter what we feel about it. Because we know that our knowledge is limited, but that God is trustworthy. Paul wrote to Titus, for the faith of God's elect, for the faith of those who believe in Jesus, that, uh, and then their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. So Titus was a true teacher but there were a lot of false teachers that were coming into the church all over the place. These trying to find a place of leadership. And Paul repeated the words of Jesus. You're going to know the difference between the godly leaders and the false teachers by their fruit, by their lives, by their lifestyles. And anyone who's teaching the truth of God's word is teaching a transformative word. You are going to be more like Jesus when you learn God's word. You are going to be less like Jesus when you listen to a false teacher. You're going to be more like Jesus when you obey Jesus. You're going to be less like Jesus when you follow the example of false teachers, false prophets. So, in the last verse of Titus chapter 1, Paul wrote about these false teachers. They claim to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work. So chapter 1 Paul said, Titus, you've got to fix this and make sure these false teachers don't have these places of prominence in churches. But chapter 2 tells us this is what you're to do instead. This is what you need to come in and teach instead. So verse 1, you are to proclaim things consistent with sound teaching, he said to Titus. Things consistent with sound teaching. Sound teaching is the teaching that leads to godliness. 
So he said, you're going to teach these things. All right. And so he finds five categories of people in the church and says, here's the kinds of things that each of these people need. Older men, how many of you would say you're in that category? Quite a few of you would say, yeah, I'm in the older man category, right? Older women. I see some reluctance with those hands, but they're uh, older women category. And then younger men. All right, younger men. And then, uh, yes, and then younger women. And, of course, we may have them working over in the children's building. But, um, and younger women. Wait, that's just four, but there's five categories. Slaves. Does that make you feel uncomfortable just to read that? Maybe, maybe it does. Older men, older women, younger men, younger women, and slaves. It's interesting that there's a category there, but let me tell you what. When God brought salvation into the world, he brought salvation into a broken world and for everyone in it. So there are those who found themselves older men when they discovered Christ and some who found themselves older women when they discovered Christ. They were advanced in age and they discovered the blessed hope. But there are some who were young men, young women. There are even those who found themselves in the bondage of slavery when they found freedom in Christ. And so Paul instructs, there is a way that each of us have to live within the life that we, within our stage of life, within where we are, and this is important. So he said to, to Titus, proclaim the things that are consistent with sound doctrine. And then he tells how to teach people to live. But I want us to understand some, I think you know it, but I want us to understand that there is a distinction we need to make. Living a certain way and scoring enough good person points is not going to get you to a place of right standing with God. This is written for people who already belong to God. And now how should we live as we wait for Jesus to come back? All right? So the sound doctrine that Paul taught can be summarized in Romans chapter 3. You all memorize that one verse, uh, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but it's part of a paragraph that gives us the good news of the gospel in a nutshell. Romans chapter 3 says this, chapter, verse 21, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented Him as an atoning sacrifice in His blood received through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint God passed over the sins previously committed God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be righteous and declare righteous the one who has faith in Jesus in other words the doctrine the sound doctrine that all of us need to start from is this. God gifted redemption, salvation to all who believe in Jesus. It comes through Jesus and exclusively through him for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But Christ Jesus shed his blood to pay the price to redeem us. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin, but Christ gave his blood for us. He died and rose again. So that is our hope. That is our salvation. And we have to start from there. None of this how should we live lifestyle stuff 
makes a difference until you first decide that you will trust God in all things and rely upon Him for all things, including your salvation. Because apart from God, we can't do it. We all fall short. Let me prove it to you. You say, well, you know, if I try really hard, I can live up to God's standard. Let me prove to you how you can't. Think about your own standard and how you know that your own standard must be way less than God's standard. Now, have you lived up to your own standard? You've fallen short of your own fallen standard. How do you think you could have lived up to God's perfect, holy standard? We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I, it's easy to prove. Who here hasn't lived with some feeling of shame or guilt in their life at some point? All of us have. And so none of us can try to, in some self-righteous way, do enough to earn a relationship with God. That relationship comes first and foremost from God who made us because he loves us. Amen. And by God's grace, we can be saved through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the first and foremost teaching. And so all of Titus chapter 2 is for people who have come to a place where they've trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior first. So hear me. If you are looking for righteousness, that's not what you're going to find in chapter 2. You're going to find holiness as people who belong to the Lord in chapter 2 of Titus. Your righteousness has to come through faith in Jesus first. But once we have come to a place where we belong to Jesus there has got to be some evidence of that change in us. There's going to be something that pours out from us that says, when I look at that person, I look at a person and I know that person trusts God. I know that person loves God because I can see it in the way he acts. Um, just jumping back to the false teachers thing one more time. I think all of us have heard somebody who's a great speaker. Somebody who, especially on television, but somebody who just captures your attention and they seem to be saying all kinds of things that are true. But when you look at who they are, you say, you know, they don't seem that redeemed. They seem just kind of common. That should be a clue. There's another type of, uh, especially the television people, and I don't mean to pick on them, or the internet people who put up a video of all their teachings, but that's the only thing you ever know about them. You can't evaluate their lifestyle. You don't know. They're only on screen when they're telling you what to do or think or believe. You really just have to say, okay, that's interesting, but I need, a, I need somebody that I can look at and know. I've been to their house. I've watched them on the street. I know what they talk like, what they act like. I know what they do. Say, so I think... I've seen enough of this person that I can trust they belong to the Lord. That's what Paul was telling Timothy. You really, 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 really have to test out all people who are church leaders, pastors, Sunday school teachers, deacons, whatever else. Look at their lifestyle. Do you see a person who obviously loves God by the way they live or do you see somebody just like everyone else or somebody that hides their life? That is really going to be the measure how we're going to know if we have the right kinds of people in leadership. But once we've got that in place, Titus, Paul said, here's what we want our people to do. Now remember, this was the island of Crete, right? This church had started among a people that Paul had called in chapter 1. Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. <laughs> Quoting their own people. The church had to look different than evil beasts, lazy gluttons. It had to look different than liars. Titus 2, verse 2. Older men, raise your hands again so you know that I'm talking to you. 
are to be self-controlled, worthy of respect, sensible and sound in faith, love and endurance. Older men, uh, by the way, when the Bible says older men and older women, it's, it's considering that empty nest generation and beyond. When your children have left home and have begun their own households. At that point, you're an older man or an older woman. And some of you are thinking to yourselves, you know, I didn't realize that most of my life I was going to be an older man. But uh, that's, that's the reality. So, there's, there is, uh, there's a change that comes over us. When we're a young man, we're striving uh, to accomplish something, to, to, to find our place in this world, to, to, you know, to be recognized as a man. And then you, you begin to start a family and you have the, the job of, of providing protection and, and sustenance for the family and, and uh, to, to provide an example for your children. And, to, and, and there's a whole aspect of life where you're trying to raise that family. But then when the family... The children have gone and become adults of their own and started their own families, and you're hitting a, a retirement age, there comes a point where you think, well, all of this stuff that I was striving for is not as important as it used to be. You know, I've got my home now. I'm settled down. My wife and I are advanced in years, and now it's time to just sort of sit back and, and um, just see, see, watch life go by, so to speak. And older men can sometimes feel like, you know, I've done all the spiritual growing that I need to do. I've hit the point of maturity. I got the respect I needed. I've got the gray hairs to prove it. And now, uh, now I'm just fine. You know, uh, I've sort of hit my place and it doesn't really matter that much if I'm striving for godliness anymore. But... Paul said, Titus, teach these older men to be self-controlled. That is, you're still making the decisions in your life on purpose. So easy to get to a place where we're not making the decisions in our life on purpose. That we're just sort of letting the day lead us. Worthy of respect. Sensible. Sound in faith, love. And that last word there, endurance. I think that's the one that I want you to hear the most, older men in the congregation today. God intends for every older man to finish strong. However many years, and like I said, the older men years is the longest years of your life, quite likely, that you need to have an endurance. And you say to yourself, you know, it still matters. It still matters what I do. It still matters the choices I make. I still am going to honor or dishonor God in my thoughts, my actions, my words, the things I see, the places I go, the way I treat people. So I want you to see that and I want you to say to yourself, today is the day, even in my older age, that I need to grow in Christ and in godliness. And you need to be able to say to yourself, next week I'm going to be an even godlier man than I am this week. I'm still moving forward because God has plenty for you to do for him in this life. In the same way, it says, so the instruction continues, older women, raise your hand if you're in that category, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers. Let me just stop before I read any further than that. Reverent in behavior and not slanderers. Slanderers, by the way, uh, is, is a close cousin to gossip and innuendo. Irreverence is a close cousin to criticism. It's very easy for older women to get to a place where out of stress or frustration or bitterness or whatever else, 
to get to a place where they want to criticize, they want to gossip, they want to talk about others. Please don't let that be you. With our words, we can build people up and you can make a person stand three inches taller by your words. And by your words, you can make somebody want to go home and kill themselves. You have so much power in the things you say. And Christian women are to be a different kind of women, not Cretans, not liars, not slanderers, not women uh, who are irreverent in their talk. Older women have so much power. You older ladies have more power in the things that you say than you realize. The power to build up and the power to tear down. To build up a church and to tear down a church. To build up a pastor and to tear down a pastor. To build up a sister and to tear down a sister. To build up a brother and to tear down a brother. To rear up another generation of women in godliness or to discourage them. I don't think the older women realize how much power is in their tongues. But Paul said to Titus, when you teach the older women, teach them to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not slaves to excessive drinking, which tended to be a big deal in Crete. You know, you ever heard the expression midlife crisis? Okay. Uh, midlife crisis is that moment in your life where you think, is this all I'm ever going to be or is there something else? Is this all there's ever going to be or is there going to be something else? You know, at a certain point in your life, you're sort of channeling up. You're, you know, you're seeking your kingdom. You're trying to find your castle, your prince, your princess, whatever else. There's a certain point where you, you get to, you've had your children and you've sort of established yourself and you think, is this the high point? And that's when, that's when things can change. Because you start to, to think to yourself, is this everything? At that point, you've got you to understand, number one, that's most likely the devil is trying to get you down. But um, you're going to either develop a critical spirit towards everybody and everything else, or you're going to find a contented godliness. And older women are at the point where that there's something in your life that's changed. At one point, um, you may have had children that you were rearing up. There was a lot going on in the household, and, and your identity was, was in that. And then now, uh, the children have gone, and it's just you and that husband of yours and um, you've got, you look at that and say, okay, both the husband and wife, the older man and the older woman, you get to a point where the expectations of life have changed. And Paul warned believers, when we get to that place, we need to be careful that we don't let whatever our expectations were transform our heart into a bitter heart. We need to get to a place where we realize all that we do needs to be done to the glory of God and even in our older years we can do a great deal of good. Now let me talk about that good. First, for uh, it actually says here uh, in verse 4 speaking of the older women so that okay, do all these good things so that Something good's coming here. That they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, be self-controlled, pure, workers at home, kind, and in submission to their husbands so that God's word will not be slandered. Paul instructed Titus to tell the older women to instruct the younger women. It wasn't Titus's job uh, 
Beware of a pastor that wants to teach the ladies, young ladies, Sunday school class. Something's wrong there, right? Um, the, Titus was not to speak directly to the young women, telling them what to be, to speak generally to the congregation, but it was the job and duty of the older women to be an encouragement to the younger women, to encourage them in godliness, to encourage them. You know, older women have a faithfulness story to tell quite often. They say, look, I went through some tough times. And um, what you're going through is not unique. I went through just as bad. Um, but let me tell you what, when you're faithful, you're going to be thankful that you were faithful. So encourage the young women to love their husbands and to love their children more when, when there's love in a household it smells different, doesn't it? You've been into a house where there's love and you want to go into that house every time you pass by. You go into a house where there's turmoil and you want to avoid that, don't you? I mean, everybody knows. There are some people's homes you go into and you, you leave. I was loved today. And there are other people's homes you go and you, I'm glad I got out of there when I did. <laughs> to be self-controlled. That seems to be a theme for everybody. Self-control, pure now, workers at home and kind is a compound word in Greek. It may actually just be one thing, but the idea is that uh, men would go out and work and the women would take care of the domestic things, but either way, whatever, the man or the woman, you needed to be efficient and responsible in all the things that you were entrusted with. This is kind. Here's another hard thing for young women to learn. Um, that kindness, that, that kindness and not the bitterness um, is going to set the attitude of the home. You ever seen that, that thing on the wall in some places? Finish it for me if you've seen it. If mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, right? If mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. You see that on the wall. And is that true? It's true. When, when, when Paul said to that the older ladies should encourage the younger women to be kind, saying, look, you have a choice to be joyous or to be bitter, and that is going to set the stage for your whole household. If mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Well, part of that is we need to do what it takes to make mama happy, right? We need to, but the other part of that is mama needs to have, to make the choice of what kind of household she's going to live in. So, all right. And in submission to their husbands, does that bother you? In, in today's time, saying a, a woman should submit to her husband is, is like a landmine if you say it publicly. You know, shouldn't, don't say that part out loud. But, but yes, do you know that Jesus was submitted to God the Father in all things? The Bible tells us the word submission appears with respect to Jesus more than it does with anyone else. Do you think of Jesus as any less than God the Father? No, you don't, because you know that he is God of God, just as God the Father is God, just as the Holy Spirit is God. It doesn't make a person less to submit to someone else. It does help us create order. And as long as I seem to be on some sort of rant about expressions I've heard out there, you've heard this one before too. Too many chiefs, not enough Indians. Um, the problem is not everybody can be the person to lead. Most everybody needs to follow and some people lead. Leading is a tough job because you have to own it when you're wrong, when you lead the wrong way, and when you fail. You have to shoulder that and say, I led us incorrectly. I failed at what I was supposed to do. The buck stops here. If you are not the leader, you can say, well, it was that person's fault. I was following, <laughs> right? Um, there is a burden in being the leader. God seems to have known what he was doing, and he designed that burden to be shouldered by men, by husbands in a household. And women have the ability to set the attitude of the home. I've heard the expression, the man is the head, but the woman is the neck. <laughs> she can turn the head where it wants to go. But the point is, um, there needs to be an order in the home. 
And it is an expression of godliness when the wife submits to the husband. And I know that many husbands are anxious about what that means. And so are many wives, but let's obey the Lord so that God's word will not be slandered. In the same way, here we have again, younger men. In the same way, Paul might say here, Titus, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. There's self-control again. The Christian life is marked by self-control, not by passion, not by whatever, not by drifting with the current, not by going with the winds of the world, not by any of that, but by self-control. I'm going to choose to do what God's word says. And he said to Timothy, you set the example for them. So older women are to encourage and teach the younger women, but Titus, Timothy, other leaders in the church, you men, you go ahead and stand in front of those young men and you show them how it's done. So he's given this direct teaching responsibility to Titus in the same way, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. Make yourself an example of good works with integrity and dignity in your teaching. That means he's living what he preaches. Your message should be sound beyond reproach so that any opponent will be ashamed because he doesn't have anything bad to say about us. Your message being sound means you're going to live, you're going to practice what you preach, and you're going to see it. Finally, slaves are to submit to their masters in everything and to be well-pleasing, not talking back or stealing, but demonstrating utter faithfulness so that they may adorn the teaching of God our Savior in everything. Now think about slaves on the island of Crete. Think about um, these people who have come to Christ and not everything in the world is the way it ought to be, but God is concerned that he has redeemed their souls, redeemed them for salvation, redeemed them to brotherhood and fellowship in the church. There's no Jew or Greek, male or female, flavor free in the church for brothers and sisters. There is, there is that, uh, that, that rising up to the level of absolute brotherhood, even with your earthly master, if your earthly master's in the church. But when it comes to godly living, when it comes to the transformative work of God in your life, your primary concern is not if somebody else is doing it right. Your primary concern is what do I need to do to honor my God and that he might not be slandered. So, you can't change the world around you sometimes, but you can be obedient where you are. And on Crete, there were slaves, slaves that were Christians. And Paul said, submit to your masters in everything. That's going to look quite different than every other slave out there. Be well-pleasing, not talking back or stealing, but demonstrating utter faithfulness so that they may adorn the teaching of God our Savior in everything. I think that when you look back at history, that the Word of God spread. Here's something that I found amazing. You read through the book of Acts and you get the idea that Paul and his missionary team were the reason that Christ was spread all throughout Asia Minor, all the way out to Rome. But if you read history, the second century of the church, when it continued to spread far and wide and the number of Christians multiplied, the number of nations where people were coming to hear Christ or were coming to salvation in Christ multiplied. The church grew more in the second century by far than it did in the first century. And yet in all of Christian history, we can't find the names of any missionaries in the second century. We look and we look and we look and you know where we found out how the gospel was spreading? Three people. The, rather, three kinds of people slaves being traded from one place to another that didn't look like regular slaves because they had a heart that belonged to someone else, to, to the Lord. 
They lived as though this world is not their home. And slaves being traded from one place to another brought the gospel to more places in the second century than you can imagine. Soldiers was the other, another. Soldiers who had no choice of their own but sent off to war, sent off to conquest, sent off to peacekeeping in other countries brought the gospel with them. And the third was merchants, people who went uh, to deliver goods or receive goods from other places. Slaves, soldiers, and merchants were the great missionaries of the second century and the reason the gospel spread so far. And all of these uh, I, merchants may be a little different category, but sl slaves and soldiers were being told what to do and didn't have their own uh, choice. They were told where to go, told how to live, told what they had to do, given their responsibilities. They were not in charge of themselves. Someone else was, and yet they graciously lived out the Christian life under those circumstances, and the gospel flourished. So, we don't have slavery here where we are locally in modern day, but we do have circumstances that are less than ideal for people. And you may say, I, I don't like the things that are going on, it's not fair, this or that. Well, maybe not. But God has called us to live as a special people. And this is the conclusion. For the grace of God has appeared, Jesus came. Bringing salvation for all people, Jesus came. Instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lust and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in this present age. Salvation has come, bought with a price, bought by Jesus, given to all who trust in him, but there's an expectation it instructs us to deny godlessness and worldly lust and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in this present age. It is going to transform our character. And folks, this is not passive. This is an obedience choice. God gives you salvation because he is gracious and he calls you to obedience and you can obey because his spirit is in you. You must choose. Instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lust and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope. Who is the blessed hope? Jesus. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. By the way, if anybody ever says, uh, the Bible never says Jesus is God, look at that verse right there, God and Savior Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession, eager to do good works. We have instructions on how to live until Jesus comes back. A character and a lifestyle, and not passively, but eager to do good works. That means we're going to go out and do what we can for God. And then the concluding verse of this chapter, proclaim these things, encourage and rebuke with all authority, let no one disregard you. So Titus, he said, you've got a job to do. You've got to bring the church to a place of loving obedience to God. And every pastor's job is to do that. And if that requires a rebuke, it requires a rebuke. If it requires encouragement, it requires an encouragement. If it requires standing up to a bully, it requires standing up to a bully. But let me tell you what. This church and every church that belongs to the Lord needs to be full of people who love God and live for Him. Are you anxious to live for God today? Are you willing to be obedient in all things, in all circumstances, in all times so that the gospel might be known, that Jesus might be honored? Are you ready to do that this week? Amen. Me too. Stand up as we close in prayer. Have our invitation. And uh, if you need to just commit this week to the Lord in a special way, then during our song of invitation, you're going to come forward. Heavenly Father, thank you for the encouragement from Titus chapter 2. And Father, thank you that you've given us 
and instruction on how to live. And we need the reminder, oh God, that the obedience is our choice. Help us to choose you daily. And Father, for those who have lived drifting, I ask, Lord, that you would call them to a special accounting today. That each person might commit themselves fully to obedience. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Come lead us in a song of invitation.